Hi, this is Kyle Z with In Session Audio. In this video, I'm going to pull back the curtain and share how the Fluid Harmonics Library came to exist, starting with the seed of the idea, the design and layout of the user interface, to the recording sessions, the graphic design process, and ultimately the programming of the instrument. So let's start at the start with the question, why even create an instrument like this? Well, having developed and produced over 30 loop libraries between In Session Audio and 9V Audio, the initial idea for fluid harmonics was really born out of what I both love, but also find frustrating with loop libraries. What I love about a great loop library is that they are instantly inspiring to use. Through a combination of performance, sound design, and good recording techniques, one loop can spark the idea for an entire track. But what can be frustrating is when you find a loop you'd like to use, but there's an aspect to it that you can't change, like the key, tempo, rhythm, or chord voicing. This set me to think, how can I create an instrument that combines the instant inspiration factor of loops while giving the musician complete control over all aspects of the harmony, rhythm, and sound design? And these two drawings are what I came up with. These are my equivalent of the cocktail napkin idea, and in fact, it does look like I was drinking while I drew them, but sadly, I have to admit that I wasn't. I think it could have been better if I'd used a crayon. But as you can clearly see, my idea was to put three independent arpeggiators into one engine. As I imagined hearing it in my head, three arpeggiators able to modify five parameters each moving with three different rhythms in three different directions with three different sound sources all at the same time, well, that could create a very cool and complex sound by holding just a few notes on a keyboard. So early on, before it had even been proven that this was possible to do within contact, I started to call it the triple play engine. Now, many years ago, I toyed with this concept in all three duo sample libraries I produced for 9V Audio, except I only used two arpeggiators. Here's an example from Duo Teen Click. Still sounds cool, but the implementation was never what I truly wanted. Using two arps meant you had to combine two contact instruments into a multi patch which leaves a lot to be desired because any changes you want to make have to be done twice. For example, if you want to turn off the humanization functions, you have to click the tab, adjust a bunch of knobs, and then repeat the same exact steps here. So despite my poor drawings, one of the initial concepts was that everything had to tie into one interface with no secret controls under the hood. Anyway, Coinciding with the design concept was the idea to base the library around a collection of guitar harmonic samples. Now this might not seem like an obvious choice, but I had three reasons for doing it. First and foremost was just the sound itself. There's a familiar yet mystical and beautiful sound to them. And when friends would ask, why guitar harmonics? I would half jokingly reply that they're the fairy dust of the guitar world. They've got that sparkle. And if you've ever played with a guitar player, for some reason they're always trying to sneak them in everywhere they can, and I am no exception. They're very addictive. The second reason is that a collection in this size, scope, and breadth had never existed. While there are a few developers that have created products that center around guitar harmonics, they typically feature just a few guitars and have just a handful of sound shaping capabilities. The third reason has to do with my own personal experience. The first time I specifically recorded harmonics was for a library called Electronic Guitars. This was probably 9 or 10 years ago. I was trying to record a set of loops based around harmonics, but I had two problems. One, I couldn't play the part accurately enough to later combine it with effects to give it the electronic-ish sound I was after. And secondly, even if I could execute a perfect performance, the assortment of notes I wanted to use didn't even exist because as you probably know, the only harmonics that are strong and clean enough to use sit on top of the 5th, 7th, and 12th frets of the guitar, with many notes repeated within those 18 places. So it became pretty limiting pretty quickly. Now, it had never occurred to me to sample anything, but I suppose I saw it as a means to an end to getting the part right, and so that was my first foray into sampling, 
sampling the harmonics from my guitar. So it's really come full circle at this point. And uh, let's go back and hear what this loop sounds like. Let's get to the guitars and sampling process for this library. We used a dozen acoustic guitars, the 10 shown here, plus a Guild 12 string and a Guild acoustic bass. With all of the acoustic guitars, I recorded harmonic sets played both with a pick and with my fingers. I used three traditional steel strings, all Bedell brand guitars, in auditorium, parlor, and orchestra body shapes. There are two 12 strings, a Gibson and the Guild two nylon strings, a Yamaha and a La Patrie, another steel string, but this one is a Martin in what's called a high strung or Nashville tuning, where all the bass strings are replaced with treble strings. This is the sound from Pink Floyd's Hey You and the first guitar you hear in Wild Horses by the Rolling Stones. And then we have what I call the down home selection, consisting of a six string banjo, a brass bodied regal resonator, and a wood-bodied gold tone resonator, or what you might call a Dobro-style guitar. All of these guitars were recorded with a Neumann KM-184 and Royer R-122, a combination which we found through the recording of our resonator guitar loop collection to be super flexible because the Neumann captures an amazing level of detail, while the Royer ribbon mic has a lovely warmth and smoothness. So combining those microphones just gives you the best of both worlds. Both of these mics were run through a Benchmark 420 preamp, which I've used on a number of projects because it's just ultra quiet. Beyond the microphones, as you may have noticed, we used a guitar holder so that the guitar's position could not shift while being recorded. If you've ever recorded acoustic guitars, you'll know that the smallest shifts of the guitar's body can change the tone of the recording. So this helped ensure consistency throughout the project. And finally, Every guitar, including the electrics, were prepped before and in between the recording of each and every string. As you can see, these pictures were taken while recording harmonics on the G string, as I've got foam under all the other strings, as well as a piece of fabric wrapped around the strings between the guitar's nut and tuners. The reason for this is that harmonics will make other strings resonate, and if not accounted for by muting them, you end up with overtones in the samples, which makes them very unusable when they're stretched across multiple notes of a keyboard. I should also take a moment to address something I said earlier, that the best and most useful harmonics exist around the 5th, 7th, and 12th frets. While this is true, with every guitar used on this project, I used a combination of capos, drop tunings, and alternate tunings in order to get more harmonic notes than would normally be possible, as well as to maximize the natural playable range of each instrument. I actually had to put it all on a spreadsheet to keep up with it. Anyway, let's get to the electrics. I recorded 18 electrics, the 15 shown here, plus a choral electric sitar, a Schecter 7 string, a 12 string Fender Stratocaster, and a pedal steel. All of these were played with a pick, with the exception of the basses, which were played with a pick and with fingers. A lot of these models will be familiar to many of you, so I'll go over them quickly from the top left got a Gibson SG, a Gibson Baritone Les Paul, a Fender Jazzmaster, a Gibson Les Paul Standard, a Burns 12 string, and a PRS. Then on the bottom, we've got an Epiphone Riviera, an Epiphone Mando Bird, which is essentially a four-string electric mandolin. And then we've got a Gibson Thunderbird bass, a Fender Stratocaster, a Fender P bass, a Phantom Mini 12, which sounds just really magical, a Burns Baritone, and finally a Fender Telecaster. All of the guitars were sampled over about a 10 week period, and as each recording was finished, I would send the files over to Editor-in-Chief Anthony Mena. Anthony has brought his skills to many of the other In Session Audio titles, and chances are if you own other sample or loop libraries by other developers, you have one or more that he's worked on. Anyway, Anthony would use several programs to take the raw recordings, extract each note, and put them into individual WAV files, name them, map them to the keyboard, and set up the round robin switching. Now what I've left out so far is how the interface came to exist. This brings in two other gentlemen, programmer and contact scripter Mario Crucial and graphic artist Frank Flitton. Fortunate for me, Anthony had worked on several projects with Mario, and so he made an introduction. Within the first week or so of meeting Mario, we spent many hours on Skype calls between my base of Nashville, Tennessee, and his in Croatia, 
discussing the feature set, layout, and how everything could interact. Based on our discussions, I began a process of formalizing the graphical layout in Photoshop. Many iterations later, and after nearly a month of discussions, we arrived at a layout that seemed like it could work, and what I knew from the beginning would be an ambitious design turned out even more so through my collaboration with Mario. Mario was keen to implement some brand new programming features that Native Instruments had just added to the contact scripting language. Chief among them was dynamic effect loading, meaning you can load any effect directly from the interface. With this feature, he also figured out how to swap the positions of effects and designed what came to be known as the filter matrix, allowing users to select from 32 different filter variations. To my knowledge, none of these features have been seen in a contact library until now. Anyway, once we finalized the layout, I had a user interface document 15 pages long, describing most of the controls, their ranges, and how they interacted with various contact parameters. And I had a separate 33-page document of design notes, requirements, and specifications for the graphic designer. So now it was time to make the interface look like something you'd actually want to use. Although I have some experience creating user interface graphics, I wanted to have a fresh perspective and to have someone whose experience would honor what Anthony and Mario were bringing to the table. Through an online portfolio of interface designs, I came across Frank Flitton's work. I reached out to him, and within a day or so, we had the first of many Skype design sessions between Tennessee and his home of Ontario, Canada. I didn't give Frank a ton of direction, other than I wanted to use a lot of color, and I didn't want it to look like a synthesizer. Based on our initial conversations, Frank had the idea of making triangular-shaped controls and made some fantastic initial mock-ups. After further development of the overall look, we ultimately decided to round out the corners to make the controls look like a guitar pick, and we maintained the liquid effect. This was a real stroke of luck for me, as the working title for the library at the time was Harmonical, a name I arrived at by combining the words harmonic and monocle, which I smartly explained to anyone that would listen, it means we're having a closer look at harmonics, which doesn't really make sense since you don't look at harmonics, you hear them. And additionally, it didn't tie into the triple play engine concept, which was such a huge factor. So once the liquid pick design was in place, everything started to tie together much better, and the project was renamed Fluid Harmonics, with the term fluid being used to describe the flowing type of sound that the three arpeggiators could make. About seven weeks after initial contact and lots of emails, Skype calls, and iterations, the artwork was completed. In the process, yet another document was created, this time 16 pages, outlining all the details of the various graphical specifications. Anyway, the final library has 151 different graphic files, many of which are comprised of multiple variations of images to accommodate the variety of backdrops, layer changes, and of course the buttons. With the graphics ready, Mario went to work adding all the functionality that connects to the user interface, which was a monstrous task because we were doing many things that had not been done before, and then multiplying it by three. Just setting up all the graphics to switch between layers, panels, and effect bins took several weeks, and we still had to make the engine work. Although I lost count, I would say that we had over a hundred iterations of the engine before arriving at the final version. The final code, also known as a contact script, seems to go on forever. Over the months that Mario was developing the script, I was still creating content for the library. I made around 120 multi-sample synth patches to be included in the library to underlay and complement the guitar harmonics. Anthony edited, looped, and assembled all of those. Of the 120, we put 100 into the final library. I created impulse responses so we could have all manner of reverbs, and I created guitar cabinet impulse responses for the ISA cab effect module. I also put together the effect presets, of which there are 64 between all the categories. And during this time, I also met with producer and mixer David Browning for several EQ and tweak sessions for all the acoustic material. So, with our first conversation having begun on April 27th of 2015, we had our first version of the library that was working reasonably well by the end of November. 
This was nearly two months later than our projected release date. Fast forward to 2016, when Fluid Harmonics made its debut. There really is a ton more I could tell you about every aspect of this project, but then this would be hours long. But suffice it to say that projects like this and others can only be arrived at by combining passion, expertise, creativity, problem solving, and just a lot of what I call stick to itiveness. Thank you for watching, and thank you to all the musicians that support us through purchasing the library. I hope you enjoy it.